the f topic today was really to talk about vapor mobility. And so uh, I don't know whether we need to, that's perhaps not the, the very best figure to look at for that. There's a, oh, I don't know. I don't see it right now. Oh, this is it, yeah. So um, in many of the cases we've been talking about, um, we spent a little, great deal of time talking about the distribution of, first of all, the architecture, if you like, of this uh, spill uh, below the spill site, either for a denser than water or a lighter than water component and how that might arrange itself. Um, we know that the rates at which it gets into this final configuration is controlled by things like relative permeabilities, which are functions of saturations. We know that the final resting place of these components are controlled by capillary pressure versus saturation curves. And we know how to use those to say something about what that distribution of saturation would be and to actually make some sense of what the architecture of what this is. Um, we know that once it's in place below the groundwater zone, that the behavior is controlled by dissolution into the water and then it's uh, transport uh, down gradient. Uh, as controlled by the, the advective motion of the fluids. And we know plenty about that in terms of both conservative transport, where it just gets dissolved at some concentration and then carried downstream, and also non-conservative transport, where it gets uh, sorbed and attached to, for instance, the grains in the aquifer or organic carbon that is present within the aquifer. And we know what the ramifications of that are. And so today we'll kind of round that out by realizing that, of course, this stuff has to pass through the Vado zone. And so a portion of the inventory that gets spilled is not present below the groundwater table, but is present above it. And so the questions are, what are the mechanisms by which that can be um, transported either in the vapor phase in, this, uh, in the Vado zone or carried by rainwater which will infiltrate across this surface, dissolve it and then give some loading to the groundwater table which will then carry it downstream. So that's our uh, assignment if you like for, for today to attempt to, to shed light on that. Some of the, this revolves around the concepts that we've talked about in terms of uh, the behavior in this, the, the groundwater zone uh, in that if you recall that when we're talking about the lengths uh, that components will travel can be approximated by the product of velocity, advective velocity, and time, and if it's uh, non-conservative, by the magnitude of the retardation coefficient. So we know that the length at which it'll travel down gradient will be reduced in the case that it's retarded because it's sorbed, taken out of the liquid phase, dissolved in liquid, and actually attached to the static um, groundwater aquifer. And the length it can travel will be shortened as a, as a result. And the time it takes to travel downstream, I guess we can also define, again, basically in terms of this relationship, if we know that velocity is equal to length over time, then the advective velocity is reduced by a certain amount. So by rearranging this, the time taken for it to go any particular length will be given by the length divided by the velocity and the time taken for it to arrive downstream will be this magnitude multiplied by the retardation. And so this time here would be length times retardation divided by time. And so it'll take longer to get downstream. In the cases that we uh, write it in terms of this uh, poor volume magnitude, then we can take this same expression and we can just rearrange this in terms of this non-dimensional time, which would give us something like time multiplied by velocity and divided by length and retardation. And that is our non-dimensional parameter. And so this scaling here 
would be in terms of that magnitude which is time velocity length times retardation and if you think about these individual components um, a velocity divided by a length is 1 over time so this term L over V if you like is the time taken for it to travel the length of the sample when the actual time is equal to that length of time it's taken to travel that's one pore volume and then depending on whether it's retarded or not would determine whether this is stretched out or not so this value here would be this retardation this T sub R values of, of, uh, of one and so you'll also be reminded of the fact that when we talk about these behaviors these rates of flows represent fast transport in terms of Peclet numbers where there's not very much um, diffusion in the system, it's mainly advection, and Peclet numbers which approach uh, being diffusion dominated, where Peclet numbers are equal to one, and the shapes of these curves we can get from those expressions that we uh, explored, I think, in period three colon one. So, uh, and so, and which come directly out of out of Feder. So this is kind of a summary of, of our discussion on retardation when we're talking about flow within the groundwater zone. So when it flows in the region which is uh, at some depth. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we can use those same kind of concepts to relate to what will happen in the Vado zone when stuff is held there by Capri forces and it can be transported in a variety of different ways. And so that's our, our goal for today is to kind of explore that. And so the things we'll talk about, the mechanisms of transport are by diffusion of gas within the uh, pore space. Uh, it can partition between different phases in the same way as in the groundwater zone, that the components can fit, uh, partition in the gas phase where it's present, but also in the water phase and also to, onto the solid. And as a result of that partitioning, uh, it gives this same kind of behavior that the transport is delayed. And so that's kind of the, the picture that we'll try and look at. And finally, we'll find out that the by far the biggest impact in terms of uh, contaminant loadings into the system is driven by aqueous advection. So rainfall landing on the surface, washing down through the Vado zone, dissolving these components, and then carrying it on down to the, um, the groundwater zone below. And so that's kind of what we'll talk about here. So this is a cartoon that kind of um, epitomizes all of those components. You spill something that gets held in place by Capri forces. If it is uh, warm, uh, in, in the subsurface, so it might be say 50 degrees, 55 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the subsurface, then this stuff can volatilize over time. As it volatilizes into the gas phase, it will diffuse in the gas phase. Uh, but also in addition to that, if you get infiltration onto the surface, then this will slowly wash down. And in washing down, it will carry with it portions of this material, which will ultimately load the groundwater zone, which can then be carried off by groundwater flow in the same mechanisms that we talked about, just by advection in the subsurface. So what we'll do today is we'll talk about mechanisms by which it can get transported in the Vado zone, mechanisms by which it gets uh, retarded and sorbed in the Vado zone, and finally the me mechanisms by which we'll, it can get washed out of the Vado zone and into the groundwater and then carried uh, beyond from from that so those are the mechanisms that we'll look at so in cartoon form these are the three different uh, mechanisms we look at actually we will only look at two of them we won't look at uh, dense uh, vapors but you can imagine that if you place this material and held it by capillary forces as it evaporates in the surface volatilizes uh, it'll go into aqueous uh, sorry into gaseous form and as a result of a high concentration close to its source and a low concentration away from it, it will be carried by diffusion, by fixed law. 
uh, and that's the, the first one that we'll look at. So the rates at which that will travel we can uh, define by fixed law. Uh, secondly, if we look at the role of infiltration of water into the subsurface, then the same mass that sits here can also get washed out of its location by stuff going through this. We know that this necessarily doesn't exist at 100% saturation of the Dean apple, but maybe exists at maybe uh, 10 or 20 percent of uh, the Dean apple sat the L well the, the napple saturation uh, light or dense and the water flowing through this will carry a dissolved component down to the groundwater table and once it hits the groundwater table this will get carried away and so we want to be able to understand the mechanisms by which this can occur We'll come back to Henry's law and Raoult's law again, as we, we need it in the, the future. But for now, what we can do is we can look at the, the gas phase transport. And that is really driven in exactly the same way as diffusion of an ink drop in a beaker. And that is that the gas concentration now, instead of the liquid co aqueous concentration, will d drive flow and the, the diffusive or dispersive flux that we get of that gas concentration is driven by the concentration gradient of the gas as it goes out from um, a boundary condition into the surrounding material and the rate at which it does it is controlled by some effective uh, diffusion coefficient and that's the diffusion coefficient of that material in the carrier gas, which is typically air, mainly nitrogen, uh, which is a number which might be of the order of um, 10 to the minus 6 meters per second, meters squared per second, uh, as opposed to 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second when we talk about aqueous diffusion coefficients. So three orders of magnitude faster, and some parameter that says that instead of diffusing uh, within this room, uh, if we had this uh, concentration here, if I was smoking, you'd smell the smoke, and it would travel at some rate controlled by this gaseous diffusion coefficient. But if you fill this room up with sand, so it's only diffusing within the tortuous pore space, then this has to be, this is the volumetric uh, gas content, that, uh, the volumetric um, gas content. So this would be the proportion of the space that's in this room relative to the total space that is gas filled. And so um, if um, the porosity of that material is 30% and it's all filled with gas, then this would be 30%. If the porosity is 30% and the saturation is 50% of water and 50% of gas, then it would be 15%. It would be the, the gas. Uh, volumetric gas content. So the volumetric gas content and the effective diffusion coefficient. And I guess I, I s spoke wrongly in saying that this is the diffusion coefficient in air. This is corrected for the tortuosity. Yeah. So in other words, the fact that it has to flow. Not only does it flow uh, controlled by the, the volumetric uh, cross-section, if you like, or the cross-section of the flow, but it also has a tortuosity that affects this magnitude. If we take fixed first law and we put it into uh, conservation of mass, mass of gas in minus mass of gas out equals mass accumulation of gas, fixed second law, then we get a slightly different equation, which is a bit like our diffusion advection equation, right? You remember that when we're talking about uh, advection diffusion, we have something which is an advective velocity times con concentration gradient in space. Let's not worry about that. But if diffusion is the only process by which it's traveling, then the dependent variable is this gas concentration from the side of the source, if you like, emanating away from it, and again, some kind of retardation coefficient, which we haven't said what it is yet, but we can uh, investigate what that factor is. So physically what this means is that if you look at um, 
a particular geometry and apply boundary conditions to it. So I'll try and keep these both on the same page at the same time. So if you imagine um, this is the boundary of our non-aqueous phase liquid in free phase form, which is present up to this point here. And at this particular edge of the glob, it's at a particular relative concentration. Then physically over time, what we'd expect to happen is that from this expression, what this expression means, this diffusion equation, is that progressively the, the concentration around this would be like a bell curve. This is just um, an axis of symmetry, if you like, on this vertical side. So it would be exactly the same on the left-hand side. It would be this Gaussian distribution, which is the standard uh, normal probability distribution. And that as a function of time, just as we talked about for diffusion away from an ink drop, this concentration gradient would slowly uh, move outwards with time as it attempts to get rid of this concentration gradients. So this is dx and this is dc. And so that's exactly what's driving this behavior, these concentration gradients, which, well, in fixed first law, that's exactly what drives this flow. And in this particular case, it goes from a high magnitude to a low magnitude. So this is a causing flow in this direction. This would be a negative gradient. I don't know if we have it here. I guess I don't. This should have a minus sign here for exactly the same reason as it we do in Darcy's law, that the flow occurs in the direction opposite to the to the positive gradient. So this is a negative gradient, and so the flow is minus a negative gradient, which means it's positive in the positive x direction probably overcomplicating things, but I don't, don't need to do that. So what retardation means in this, it means exactly the same as we had in the previous one, and that is if we divide both sides of this through by this retardation coefficient, then this side all of a sudden is equal to 1, and it's actually a diffusion equation, but the, the effective diffusion rate is modulated by the fact that we have a number here that's greater than 1 that will reduce the rates. And so physically what that means, uh, it's not absolutely true, but the length to which it will travel will be truncated by a factor which is basically scaled with the retardation coefficient. So if the retardation coefficient is 2, then it will go half as far as it would have done if it was conservative. And so you can think of it physically in, in those terms. So that is a parallel, if you like, to diffusion in our... Uh, aqueous system, if you like. So what we need to do to be able to define this is to be able to figure out exactly two things, I suppose. One is, what is the magnitude of this effective diffusion term? And what is the magnitude of this retardation factor? To be able to say something about the rates at which this transport will travel. And so if we take the first one first, the diffusion gradient, um, we can define it in terms of two terms. This is the, f the free diffusion. It's uh, truncated here. Is that just my bad? Yeah, it's most, mostly there, right? Free diffusion coefficient, which we'll find is of the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second for various solvents in air. And this is something that reduces the magnitude um, based on tortuosity of flow. And so you can imagine this as being the fact that if you have a molecule of gas that sits here and it has to get to this point, then instead of going through the, the straight line of flight, it has to go through this tortuous flow path. Then the tortuosity is defined as something like the length as the crow flies divided by the length it has to travel as a function of going through this uh, the, the pores to some factor. And so this is a number that is going to be less than 1 because the, lower, the numerator, uh, the denominator has to be larger than the numerator. 
And so this has to be less than one. And so you could measure that, I guess, uh, in real materials. Or you could use other characterizations. And one which is often used is this Millington quirk one from, as you see, a long time ago, which basically takes the total uh, volumetric content of the aquifer, which is really what we've called the porosity. We've called this N before. And the portion of that, the volumetric um, gas content. And so if there's no water in the system, then the volumetric gas content, the gas filling the pores would actually be equal to the porosity. Um, if it's not, then I guess the volumetric gas content is equal to the porosity multiplied by the saturation of gas. Saturation being a number between 0 and 1. If it's 100% saturated in gas, then it would be equal to the porosity. If it's 5% saturated in gas, it would be 0 0.05 times the porosity, etc. And these are just raised to different numbers. And so this is to account for this same kind of behavior. So if you do this calculation as to what this effective diffusion coefficient might be as a function of the one that you take out of the uh, reference handbook and the tortuosity calculated from Millington and Quirk, then you get something that looks like um, uh, this magnitude here. So this is a profile through the soil. This is the water table that exists here. I'm start using red. And this is basically, you could think of this almost as a capillary pressure versus saturation curve, right? This is saturation or volumetric moisture content on the lower axis. This would be zero. This would be porosity as the upper value. You could think of this as height, but you can also convert height into capillary pressures. This is just pure height in this case. And if you take the gas content, which would be the difference between, this would be the amount that's filled with um, the non-wetting fluid in this particular case, the napple that's present here. And so if this is 35% porosity, I guess that's what's being suggested here, then this amount here would be 10%. This is 25%, that makes up the entire remainder. And so you can use this in this expression. So this is 25%, this is 35%. If you use that, you can calculate what the effective um, diffusion coefficient is just by plugging those numbers in, and you end up with a number which is of the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. If you go down to the capillary fringe, where there's only 5% porosity, then this number has now dropped by two orders of magnitude, roughly. Uh, it's reduced because it's got to diffuse within the pore space in the gas component. And of course, if you go beyond that into the saturated zone, there is no gas in the, in the groundwater zone. And so the effective diffusion coefficient of those compounds in water would be the same as we talked about in um, when we talked about um, diffusion in water. So something of the order of 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second. So this is the diffusion behavior in water. And so you can imagine as you get as you go down through the column, you get these different characteristics in terms of the behavior that you'd expect to get. So that says something about the rates at which components would move. So we know if we are able to figure out exactly what the effective diffusion coefficient is, um, we can figure out exactly how quickly it would move. Uh, but to really know how it will move, especially if these components are delayed in some respect by partitioning, then we also need to know what R is to be able to factor into this as well. And so the other thing that we need to know is something about the, the partitioning behavior. And the partitioning is, I guess, slightly more complicated than just in aqueous transport because we have two components that are present. In aqueous transport, we have the water, which has the dissolved component in the water and the solid that it can sorb onto. But in this case, we have transport within the gas phase, which is able to diffuse, but then it can also get to equilibrium into the water, which surrounds the gas phase. And then once it's in the water, it then can then go and sorb onto the solid. 
so it can partition not only into the gas but also into the solid so the gas so the way you usually think about it is that it starts off within the gas phase and because the water is typically water wetting the solid all of the grains are covered by at least a mono layer of water so to get into the solid it has to go from the gas into the water and into the solid and so the usual way that's thought of is that the gas uh, goes into equilibrium concentration into the water and that water surrounds the solid and then once it's in the water then it reaches equilibrium with the solid so I guess this is the sequence gas to water to solid and so to do that we need to know exactly what the concentrations might be both within the gas and within the water and to do that we use uh, Henry's law to be able to make that uh, a quantitative evaluation and what we'll use in this class is this idea that Henry's law can be used as some kind of effective Henry's law which if the concentrations of the gases gas and water are given in the same units then by definition this value of Henry's law coefficient has to be dimensionless just by virtue of the fact that these are in the same units has to have this therefore this has zero units but the real Henry's law is typically defined in terms of concentrations in the gas and water but typically they're in different units and the other definition of Henry's law is it's given by uh, the vapor pressure of the gas above the liquid relative to its maximum solubility in the water and so these two terms are congruent and give us a value of Henry's law typically within these, well, I think they're bizarre, they're bizarre to everybody in terms of atmospheres meters cubed per mole whereas this one would just be would have no units at all and so it turns out that this is convenient for us to use and that we can always get this one if we know what this one is this is the one you'd get from a table um, a reference text on environmental engineering or whatever and so there are two behaviors that we can get we said that uh, if it's an equilibrium in the gas it'll go into the water in some concentration then Henry's law absolutely tells us about what those relative concentrations would be once it's in the water then the concentration that we have in the solid is then given by our distribution coefficient and you'll remember that when we talked about partitioning between the aqueous form which I guess would be CW here and the solid then we define this value which is typically referred to as our partition coefficient KD and we basically define the ratio of C star over C W as equal to this distribution coefficient over one just from these similar triangles if you like then what we've done before this really represents the concentration that we have in the solid relative to what we have in the water and if we know from starting from the gas concentration what this would be if we know Henry's law right if we know what the gas concentration is and we know Henry's law coefficient we can always calculate this if we know what the concentration in water is and we know the distribution coefficient then we can always calculate the amount on the solid and so if we know these two laws Henry's law for gas to water and the distribution coefficient from water to solid we can say something about the equilibrium concentrations between those three phases solid to water to gas and that's basically what we'll do and we know from last time if we can calculate these octanol water partition coefficients and if we know the fraction of organic carbon we can calculate KD and so typically we can get some value of this and so it allows us to make that sequence of calculations so it's useful to, to, to do that we won't go to the derivation of it but this retardation factor is basically given by this and this is kind of the cartoon that describes it we have solid grains water that surrounds these solid grains because it's water wetting and pore spaces between those solid grains which is ringed in water uh, we know that the gas is at some concentration uh, CG and so this would be CG 
we know that the water is at some concentration I guess it might be better to do it as blue right this is CW and we know that on the solid there's a concentration on the solid which we don't refer to so these are the three variables we're looking at gas transport so it's transport of gas within the system that we're looking at and so the other two components the stuff that gets stuck in the water and the stuff that goes from the water into the solid are both if you like sinks in taking the gas out of the air and putting it into these static components because these aren't traveling and the um, gaseous retardation coefficient that we can define is this value here it has two components without driving it the first is the part that goes into the water which is given by this term here and this signifies how much of the gas goes into the water and of course the water is static it's held by capillary forces and it's not moving as in the case of in the groundwater zone where it might be flowing under Darcy's law and then once it's at some equilibrium concentration in the water which we don't define uh, here anyway then it will also sorb into the solid and this is the part that's present here so this is the constant part that goes into the solid and this is the concentration CW I guess up till now we've always called this just C for the concentration because we've only been talking about aqueous concentrations but now we're talking about the retardation that occurs in the gas phase and so we just need to realize that it occurs for those two reasons okay so what else yeah and so you'll see that it depends on a couple of different things it depends on the volumetric moisture content the volumetric gas content and so I guess um, volumetric gas content has to be less than the porosity and greater than one sorry zero and I guess volumetric water content plus volumetric gas content have to equal the porosity so those are relationships you know right the two volumetric uh, moisture contents have to equal the total uh, porosity of the system and the gas content and the water content can only vary between zero and n I guess we could also write that here as well right So those are the three provisos for this. Volumetric moisture con water content, gas content, density of the aquifer, gas content, um, distribution coefficient, which we know, and the value of this non-dimensional Henry's law, which we define as the concentration of gas over the concentration of water. So this is our, which we'll define in a second, right? I guess you see that down here. So if we know what this material property is, if we know what this material property is, and we know what the amounts of the water and gas are in the system, we should be able to calculate what the retardation coefficient is. And if we do a, a simple calculation, we can do that. So let's assume we know how to get this Henry's Law coefficient, which is just this ratio of the gaseous and aqueous concentrations. Let's assume that we know what the octan organic carbon partition coefficient is for the organic carbon that's present within our aquifer. Let's assume we know what the solvent is that we're dealing with, which is TCE. 35% um, porosity is before. 10% uh, is, um, or I guess the saturation would be, uh, based on this, would be... Um, 30% roughly and fifth and 75% right is that right uh, the total porosity would be 35% and in this particular case um, it would be two two sevenths of the the saturation would be two sevenths of the water 
and the saturation of the gas is going to be 5 sevenths, right? Those saturations add up to 100%. So I'm just playing around with these numbers. Um, but if we then play around with the values of this fraction of organic carbon between a very, very small number, which is 100 of a percent, and a relatively larger number, which is 1 percent, then we can look at the components of the retardation factor, which are due to uh, water, which is this component, solid, which is this component. So all this is are the aqueous part, the solid part, and add to 1. And I suppose if we added um, 1 here, plus this, plus this, is equal to this, is really what we're doing. So this is 1 plus the water part, plus the solid part. And so if we take 1 plus 1.33, so the, this part is equal to 1.33. This is the part in the water. The mo moisture content isn't changing. Uh, the only thing that we're going to change are the values of the fraction of organic carbon. And so the amount in the water, amount that the water sorbs is the same. But if we change the amount of fraction of organic carbon in these two between this magnitude and this magnitude, then the amount that gets sorbed due to the distribution coefficient, this will change by a factor of 10. 100, actually, right, as we do this. So if it's for 0.01%, it's 0.27. If we increase the fraction of organic carbon by a factor of 100, this will go to 27 point whatever. And so this is the amount that's sorbed onto the immobile solid material. And if we add these two together, we get these two amounts, which are this. So the lesson, I suppose, is that the amount that gets sorbed in the water is not very much. But the amount that goes through the water and reaches equilibrium on the solid static part can be a significant amount, or it may not be. So in an aquifer that doesn't have very much carbon in it, it probably won't be. But this amount gives maybe a fraction of the retardation that is due to the water. But if in, in one which there's a large amount of organic carbon in the present, then all of a sudden this number is a, a big number. So physically, this means if we look at this figure of distance versus concentration, then if the profile for the uh, conservative behavior for r equals 1 looks like this, then for r equals 30, this length here is going to be basically L over 30, whereas this is equal to L. So the ramifications of this are uh, significant, I guess. If, L, if the retardation is equal to 2.6, then it would be roughly half the distance traveled. So, so it's important to be able to understand what those components are. So the sequence is, we know how much concentration is within the uh, gas. That goes into the water and then from the water it goes into the sun. See ya! <laughs>
of being born in water. And even if there's a velocity, an advective velocity in the water, then the rate at which this will travel is controlled by the distribution coefficient. Not just if it's diffusion in the, the groundwater zone, but also if it's advected, then the sequences of arrival are controlled by the retardation coefficient. And so if you use these expressions to calculate the uh, aqueous retardation coefficient and the gaseous retardation coefficient using the appropriate parameters, KD, Henry's law coefficient, bulk density of the aquifer, etc., gaseous um, gas coefficient, and this of course is the saturated moisture content. So I guess theta w here would be equal to the sum of the gaseous plus the uh, sorry this is this is total right this is saturated so this value here has to equal the sum of these two by definition from what we just said. Uh, then if we look at the magnitudes of these retardation coefficients calculated from consistent values of Henry's law coefficient, distribution coefficients, then we can look at the arrival times of these. So if we use uh, the distribution coefficient and Henry's law coefficient for three different um, solvents, we can calculate the aqueous retardation coefficient which are these three values here. And we can calculate the gaseous retardation coefficient, which are these three values here. Then what these things say is that if you look at the arrival sequence of materials arriving here, the first arrival will be the one with the lowest retardation coefficient, and the last arrival will be the one with the highest one. And so if we look at the mo motion in the groundwater, the smallest magnitude, the first arrival, will be this one because it has the smallest retardation coefficient. The second arrival will be this one. And the third arrival will be this one. So they'll arrive in the sequence of methyl chloride, TCE, and TCA. But if you look in the Vado zone, the retardation coefficients are in the order, the smallest is this one, again. But the next smallest is this one. And so this one and this one the second arrival will be TCA rather than TCA. So they don't rec necessarily arrive in the same sequence, and we can tell that based on the magnitudes of their retardation, retardation coefficients. So it just tells us something about the order in which we would expect those to arrive. So be aware that if we're talking about flow in the Vados, Vados zone or within the groundwater zone, then we just have different retardation coefficients and they signal the order in which things will arrive and the rates at which they're retarded relative to being carried in the system. We could also use it in the gaseous, in the, in the Vado zone as well. It's just that we're talking about stagnant airflow, no airflow, and the only mechanism of transport is by, um, by diffusion. If we had advective flux of the gas carrier component here, we could also add the same analysis in that uh, the retardation coefficient would also say something about the order in which they'd arrive. These are results from a, an experiment from a big box in uh, Oregon. You can see the size of this, 10 meters in dimension, uh, 3 meters deep, so about 10 feet, about the, the height, probably about the size of this, uh, actually much bigger than this room, right? 10 meters would be 30 feet, no, perhaps about the size of this room that's filled up with sand and into this sand there are a whole bunch of capillary tubes which are samplers at these individual points and into this is introduced a mixture of methane, butane and TCE uh, carried on a nitrogen carrier gas and then just left in place to do what it does and after 24 hours the distribution is given by these plots here and after three days it's slightly broader because it's diffused within the system um, it's traveled further in three days than it did in 24 hours because of diffusion has driven that. It's tried to, fix law has tried to ameliorate. If you took a section through here, the concentrations would look like this. And so it's tried to ameliorate these concentration gradients 
uh, by spreading out laterally. And you see that in the case of two of these, they've traveled roughly the same amounts, but in one of them, they've traveled less. And so this one presumably has traveled less because it has been more heavily retarded. So you think that the retardation for TCE would be greater than the retardation for, for instance, methane, borne out by this. And so you can check that merely by looking at the magnitudes of the Henry's law coefficients. So if you go into this, we see that the retardation coefficient is inversely proportional to uh, Henry's law coefficient. So a larger Henry's law coefficient, such as we have for methane, would give a smaller magnitude of retardation, and therefore it would travel faster in the case of that. And so you can do those calculations, but merely in terms of just looking at the relative magnitudes of these, we could see that this retardation should be larger than that for methane. And so you can show that to be the case just by doing that calculation. Okay. So we've asked you to take it on trust so far that we can get this non-dimensional Henry's law from the values of real Henry's law. So let's make sure that we can actually do that. So how do we do that? Um, we have, this is the expression we want. And we know it's a function of gas and aqueous concentrations. And so in other words, this would be a matter of taking um, a beaker of water, putting into this water um, TCE, for instance, getting it at some equilibrium concentration, which should be something about of the order of 1,100 grams per liter, or milligrams per liter, sorry. which is something of the order of the equilibrium concentration. And then the concentration in the vapor that overlays this would be this concentration of gas that we'd have here. So this is Cg, and this is solubility, which we're also calling our aqueous concentration. So if we knew exactly what these two concentrations were, we could immediately calculate the Henry's law coefficient, but often we don't have that. And so what we could do is we could try and calculate it as a function of h-bar. And it turns out that the value is this expression down here. But the logic to get that are just this. The definition of Henry's law coefficient is the vapor pressure divided by the concentration, uh, aqueous concentration. Uh, typically, this concentration is moles per cubic meter. Um, we can replace the vapor pressure in terms of the ideal gas law, which gives a pressure is equal to a density, a universal gas constant divided by the atomic weight of the gas, multiplied by temperature in terms of absolute temperature. If we substitute one into the other, then we get this expression here. So in other words, if we take this and we substitute for this, we get this expression. And if we take this equation and we divide out the parts which relate to the gas, which are this, which are merely divided here, then we end up with a portion which relates to the characteristics of the gas concentration and the concentration water. This term here represents the concentration in the gas. And this concentration is the concentration in the water. And it's multiplied through by um, universal gas constant and uh, temperature. And so we can show that in that if we look at this magnitude here, is that this merely represents the concentration of gas is just, just this term. The density of the gas divided by its uh, molecular weight and you can look at the units of this. Density of the gas is in grams per cubic meter or kilograms per cubic meter. And the uh, molecular weight is in just molecular weight, is in terms of weight per moles. Masses cancel out, and you're left with moles per cubic meter. And so it's rho over m is just moles per cubic meter of gas, which is exactly the same units as concentration in water in this particular case. 
And so the bottom line is, if you go to um, a, a reference textbook to get H prime, which is Henley's law coefficient, divided by the universal gas constant and temperature, it immediately gives you the magnitude of the, the, the non-dimensional Henry's gas law that we want and that we want to be able to use in this setting for the gaseous retardation coefficient. So it's nothing more than that. And you can check that magnitude out. If you use for TCE, the reference text value is 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 3 atmospheres meters cubed per mole. If you substitute it into this expression, universal gas constant and 20 degrees centigrade in terms of degrees Kelvin, you end up with a value which is about 0 0.4. Uh, and you can check that if you wish. If you look at the magnitude by just looking at the um, for trichloroethane, the vapor concentration in kilograms per meter cubed is something in the order of 0 0.52 kilograms per meter cubed. And if you look at the concentration, equilibrium concentration of water for TCE is something like 1,100 milligrams per liter. And if you divide 0.52, which is 520 milligrams per liter by 1,100, you end up with something which is close enough to 0 0.38. I think it's different because the magnitude of the temperature is slightly larger than our 20 degrees centigrade. But you get the same order of magnitude. And so it's important to be able to make that conversion. And so the expression that allows us to make that conversion is just this. Okay? What was that? So that allows us to say something about the rates at which um, components move in the subsurface. So out of our cartoons that we said that we were talking about, we've looked at just the first one. Uh, and we're going to look at two of them. So the second one we'd like to look at is this. The difference with dense vapor is that if the vapor is denser than the air that fills a pore space, then there'd be advection that results merely by the fact that uh, like you put if you put salt in water you can see the the salt water sink because it's denser than water you start convection currents in the gas due to the mass of the vapor which is denser than that so you could also think about applying as in soil vapor extraction putting a pressure gradient between two wells across this in which case you would drive flow by gas advection as well but we won't deal with that. Uh, and the reason we won't do that, because by far the largest influence in terms of moving um, material in the subsurface in the Vado zone is by infiltration due to water. So let's look at the, how we might do those calculations to be able to figure out exactly what the advection due to water would be. It's relatively straightforward. And so what we'll assume is that water will come in through the top of here as rain. And it would, as a function of this, wash down through the, the system. This is unsaturated or partially saturated. And it feeds into the water table at some distant di di depth below. And so one assumption we could make is that we know that this starts off with some irreducible saturation of water. And so the water that washes into the top, we can imagine joins that particular water saturation within the pore space and gets transmitted in that continuous film, if you like, as it goes from the upper surface to the water table. And so what we could assume is that the volumetric moisture content is constant. So even as stuff washes in from the top, it just gets transmitted across it in an unchanging volumetric moisture content in the liquid. The water molecule that starts at the top still transits the zone and ends up in the water table at some time, but the volumetric moisture content doesn't change. In other words, it doesn't completely fill up with moisture at the top to 100% saturation and then this plug moving. We're just assuming that at equilibrium, since it happens over a long period of time, that the rainfall events, maybe it slightly modifies, modifies the water content, 
but on average it stays the same as you go up through the water table. In other words, if you go up through the water table, the profile of moisture content might look like this. And it doesn't change. This is Z. Uh, a small amount of moisture here, a much larger amount of moisture as you get close to the water table. And as close as you go into the saturated groundwater table zone, then it doesn't change. So let's assume that this is just constant through here. If that's the case, then we can calculate the advective velocity of this because we know that uh, the advective velocity is equal to the Darcy velocity divided by the porosity, right? This is an expression that we mentioned on the very first day that we met, definition. The velocity in the pore space is given by the Darcy velocity, which we calculate from Darcy's law, divided by the porosity. And it's just a, a manifestation of the fact that the pore space is only 20%, say, of the cross-sectional area. The water's Darcy velocity is calculated across the full cross-sectional area, and so it's traveling five times as fast if we account for that porosity in terms of tra traversing this. So you can think of the infiltration rate, the rate at which it goes into the surface, as a Darcy velocity. So this really is the Darcy velocity, which is this. And this really is the effective pore space that it's traveling across, which is just the portion of the cross section which is filled with water, because we've said that that doesn't change. And so if that's the case, then we can calculate the velocity at which it moves. Um, and so if we want to know in this particular case, for instance, we're going to do an example, and I'm going to see what the, the characteristics are, 10%. So if for instance, this was equal to 10%. This was equal to 45 centimeters a year, which it is in the example we do. Then the advective velocity of water from this is going to be 10 times 45. This is going to be 4.5 meters a year. This is 0.45 of a meter multiplied by 10 for 1 over 10 percent, and you end up with this, just using this expression. So the velocity at which it would move would be 4.5 meters. So that is, so the velocity that's conservative would be equal to 4.5 meters a year. And so in the example that we'll choose, where the water table is four meters down, I'm trying to turn and work out. I'm jumping across these five meters. So in other words, if we have to travel to the water table five meters down below the uh, ground surface, it'll take about a year. If the aqueous retardation is equal to 2, then the V non-conservative is going to equal the conservative velocity divided by R. And if that's the case here, it would equal 4.5 <coughs> meters per year over 2, which is equal to 2.25 meters a year. And so if it has to travel 5 meters, it's going to take 2 years to go down. But even though it's in the Vado zone, the mechanism by which it's traveling is being borne by water. We're saying that the moisture content doesn't change, and so the cross-section that's available to that flow is limited only to the water that's in place and that's what gives us our advective velocity. So we can take a rainfall amount, 45 centimeters a year, and convert that into an advective velocity which is 4.5 millime meters. And we can use that 4.5 millimeters to count how quickly it would get to the groundwater table. One, if it was a conservative solute, which is about a year, if it's from the surface 
or if it's retarded by a factor of two, it will take two years. That's if it's traveling five meters. I guess if it starts at a depth of 2.5 meters and has to travel 2.5 meters, then it's half that amount. You, but you get the picture. So that's one question we might want to ask. If it's present in the subsurface, how long does it take to get washed down to the, the water table? I suppose the other question we might be interested to know is what's the mass loading that occurs as it's washed down every year that, as that amount of fluid goes through. And so that would be given by um, this mass flux here, which is going to be the advective flux multiplied by the volumetric moisture content multiplied by whatever the concentration is. So when we've talked about this before, this value, I guess, would be the solubility, which for TCE is something of the order of 1,100 milligrams per liter, 1,100 parts per million. And this amount here is the product of advective velocity and volumetric moisture content, which is the same as the Darcy velocity, right? So this amount here, I'm not sure why it's not moving with me. This amount here is equal to the Darcy velocity, which is exactly the same as the infiltration rate. So if this is 45 centimeters a year, then this is 45 centimeters a year. And so we can calculate that. So what that allows us to do is if we have a particular example, we should be able to calculate what the mass loading is. So this is a length per unit time. And I suppose if we really wanted a mass, we should multiply through by an area. And so we could think of a cross-sectional area if I can draw an A, that this stuff is washing through. And so if this is a unit area, then the amount QM that we get here without these A's on either side would be the mass loading per unit area. And so lowercase QM is mass flux per unit area as it washes into the groundwater table. And so here's an example that does that. So I guess I jumped the gun in some respects. This is the example, um, 45 uh, centimeters deep, I think uh, 2.5 meters to the groundwater table. Uh, infiltration rate of 45 centimeters a year. Volumetric moisture content in the Vado zone of 10%. Solubil solubility of the compound is 1,100 milligrams per liter. How long does it take to reach the water table? The advective velocity is given by the infiltration rate divided by the moisture content because we've assumed if we look at the distribution of moisture content in the Vado zone that it doesn't change. This is theta. We're ignoring the fact that it changes with depth. We're just assuming a single value, which is this. But the idea is that if you take a snapshot today, it looks like this. If you take a snapshot in May, it looks like this. If you take a snapshot in September, it looks like this. So the volumetric moisture content isn't changing. And so the cross-section that the flow occurs in through the water has to be the same cross-section. Happens to change with depth, but let's ignore that. So if you do this infiltration amount, volumetric moisture content, 4.5 meters a year. This is the conservative rate for it not being absorbed in the aqueous phase. And if it has to travel 2.5 meters in four and, a half, and it goes at 4.5 meters a year, it takes half a, half a year. If the retardation is a factor of 2, well, let's say if retardation is equal to 10, I don't know why this isn't working very well. So if retardation is a factor of 10, then advective velocity is going to be equal to 4.5 meters over 10. Which is 0.45 meters a year. Oh, the battery's about to go out. I must have to stop talking soon. Which is 0.45 meters a year. 
and to go two and a half meters it's going to take five years so if you want to calculate the mass loading we know the infiltration amount that's what this is q i n f which is 0 0.45 meters per year we know the solubility of this which is 1100 milligrams per year and we can calculate the mass loading per unit area per square meter and it turns out if we go through those calculations for these two magnitudes to be half a kilogram per square meter so it's a useful calculation and so you can use a more sophisticated model to do that I'm going to talk quickly because I don't want to lose my recording but if you go through this using a much more sophisticated model to look at examining these behaviors for um, a package of this material which is placed in an axisymmetric grid so this is the center line if you like of the system um, and you put this loading here then what it does is it diffuses outwards and this transport these are contours of concentration in the gas phase as you go out from this packet that exists here and you see they diminish by an order of magnitude as you go out each of these lengths but if you have water infiltrating through here through rainfall the amount that gets washed down to the water table is over six months something like six kilograms and over 12 months is something like 16 kilograms uh, this is double this but this is more than double this so that's merely the fact that um, water has to infiltrate to this point to be able to begin to carry it here so the initially as you wash down starting at time zero initially nothing hits here until some certain amount of time towards six months before it starts to impact this and then it starts loading it and so you'd expect this magnitude to be larger the 12 month magnitude to be larger than the six month magnitude because this represents the time it takes to get to the water table in the first place and one remediation method that you could use would be to put a liner on this surface so that all of a sudden now the rainfall that lands here can't land here but can only go into the water table here and so this is protected and if that's the case then the loading now is much less because the loading really is only by the gas contacting the water and being dissolved in the water directly from the gas which is a really low loading and so if you want to remediate these in a useful way then just stopping the water from going through allows you to drastically cut the amount of flow you get in the system and so that's uh, kind of the punchline I guess and that's it and so the bottom line is that we can look at both of these um, rates of transport in this uh, geometry here in this figure the two we've looked at are this and the two things that we can look at one are the rates at which it gets transported which is governed by this gaseous retardation coefficient which is a function of being in the gas going from the gas into the liquid and the liquid into the solid which allows us to calculate how this the magnitude of this retardation which is a function of Henry's law coefficient and that allows us to look at exactly what the profile of that plume might be as a function of time for conservative and non-conservative flow. But by far the largest influence in terms of uh, loading onto the groundwater table will result from aqueous concentrations. And for that, we can use the aqueous retardation coefficient to say how delayed it will be in hitting the water table. And we can also say something in the back of the envelope calculation in terms of the magnitude of the, the loading that will occur in that as well.